Stay tuned to PBS 39 for a focused special report on the Pennsylvania budget stalemate. With the funding plan overdue 140 days and counting, senior centers, emergency shelters, and preschool programs across the state cut services. Well, there's no money, no program. With team coverage, we show you how schools and social service agencies in our region cope without thousands, and in some cases, millions of dollars in state funding. In December, we'll begin running out of money. It's now in the second quarter, we have none of that money, so our pantries don't get that food. Hear from stakeholders with programs riding on the impasse in Harrisburg, right now on this special edition of Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking Insurance Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this focus special report on the state budget impasse. I'm Laura McHugh. Usually approved by July 1st, we're now in our fifth month without an approved funding plan. Schools and agencies in our region and across the entire state of Pennsylvania face difficult choices to keep programs from closing. Statewide, at least eight state-funded preschool programs have suspended class. Senior centers and emergency shelters are reportedly closing or cutting services. And by the end of September, reports found that school districts had already borrowed almost $350 million. We begin our team coverage of this issue with Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Grover? Thanks, Laura. The budget stalemate in Harrisburg involves numbers, but it affects people. State-funded food banks and early childhood programs struggle to serve the people in their communities. Public schools and charters have taken out loans to keep their doors open. These are just a few examples of what this deadlock has created. That last budget impasse went for 100 days. This one has already exceeded that by more than a month. Governor Tom Wolf recently announced that a solution is on the table. Time will tell, but every minute counts for the organizations most affected by this crisis. Put it in the bin. Like thousands of parents across Pennsylvania, Elise Chicherski relies on pre-K counts. When I got the letter saying that school was you know, going to be shut down temporarily and, and I just went home and I was like almost in tears. I'm like, what am I going to do with this poor child? Elise's foster daughter, Sophia, is one of 68 children who almost lost their spot in the state-funded pre-K counts program at the Growing Place Child Care Center in Broadheadsville because of Harrisburg's budget stalemate. Well, there's no money, no program. Nancy Wright serves as program coordinator for the center's pre-K counts program. Usually we get awarded the program every year and then we get it checked and then we can start the program. Well, of course, that didn't happen this year. Pre-K Counts follows a typical school schedule from September to June. But when the state budget wasn't passed in June, the center began planning for funding the program temporarily with its own money. In August, we sent the letters to the parents saying we would be opening the program until October 30th. That was the amount of money that we could safely invest in Pre-K Counts. The children spend two and a half hours, five days a week, attending the program really helps prepare them, not only academically, but socially. Sometimes I think the social aspect of it, raising their hands, sitting still, um, walking in line, routines, things like that, that's just as important as the academic. Lisa Ike, executive director for the center, sees pre-K counts as a critical program. The program is needed because there are several factors that can make a child at risk for school difficulties and one of them is family income also a special need second language uh, teenage parent but the program was about to come to a stop without funding from the state which meant layoffs for seven staff members and an interruption in the children's care and education there's only one four-year-old year for these children there's only one three-year-old year if we don't take that into consideration and we shut these programs down, that's part of their year that they will never get back. 
Joe Atori, whose son Kyle also attends the program, called the governor's office to voice his concern. If I could talk to someone, a representative, uh, just to see if there was anything that could be done or at least let them know the concern that, uh, you know, this program is important to a lot of people and it's benefiting a lot of children. While the folks at the Growing Place grapple with budgetary woes, Russ Mayo, superintendent of Allentown Schools, deals with the budget impasse's impact on his district, the third largest in the state. We're paying our electric bill, which is essential, of course. We're paying heating, et cetera. But those things that can wait, we're waiting on. The Allentown School Board approved a $50 million loan option to make ends meet through February should the budget impasse go beyond December. In December, we'll begin running out of money. We have a $9 million a month payroll alone, so we can go through millions of dollars pretty quickly. The budget stalemate's affecting education, but it's also impacting social services. The state funds the state food purchase program, which provides us with $800,000 of food money a year that we can go out and purchase staple products that our pantries and programs need. It's now in the second quarter. We have none of that money, so our pantries don't get that food. The Second Harvest Food Bank of the Lehigh Valley provides food for more than 69,000 people through more than 200 member agencies. We've been able to front about $50,000 of the money, but we can't compete. We can't come up with the $300,000, $350,000 that we would normally have at this time. Like so many other social services, Second Harvest had to stretch its resources. And in the meantime, we try to make up as much as we can with our pantries, but we know the pantries are suffering. The people at the end, who are the real people that need the food, are suffering because they're not getting the relied upon foods that somebody needs. For now, Allentown School District and Second Harvest Food Bank continue operations pending resolution of the budget impasse. The growing place in Broadheadsville also kept its pre-K counts program going thanks to a $20,000 loan from both United Way of Monroe County and the Pocono Alliance for a total of $40,000. The center announced the rescue at their annual Halloween celebration on October 30th, what was supposed to be the last day for the center's pre-K counts. It was like the last minute save and people were thrilled. On November 10th, Governor Tom Wolf announced that an agreement on the budget might be reached by Thanksgiving. To paraphrase Lisa Ike, if that happens, it'll be something to be thankful for. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. We continue our team coverage of the state budget impasse with a look at the sticking points between the governor's office and the Republican-led state legislature. For more, Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo joins us with a special guest. Brittany? Thank you, Laura. To explore how Pennsylvanians view this stalemate and the main factors involved, I'm joined by Dr. Chris Boric, a political science professor at Muhlenberg College and director of the college's Polling Institute of Public Opinion. Dr. Boric, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Brittany. This poll was conducted on behalf of Muhlenberg College in conjunction with the Morning Call. When was it conducted and who did you survey? It was conducted in October of 2015 among 457 registered voters in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And of those registered voters, 49% say they're registered Democrat, 38% say they're registered Republican, and 12 say they're registered Independent. Right. So let's head to that very first question we're going to look at today. The Pennsylvania legislature and Governor Wolf have been unable to pass a state budget, resulting in a four-month budget impasse. The first question we look at today asks, how concerned are you that Pennsylvania has not yet passed a budget for the current fiscal year? Yeah, you could see by these numbers, Brittany, that Pennsylvania registered voters are fairly concerned uh, majority say they are very concerned about this matter. This has been a long, protracted budget debate, and as we moved into the fall, I think uh, people across the state are starting to see the more serious ramifications of this problem. Now let's move on to the next question we're going to look at. You asked registered voters in general, would you say the failure to pass a state budget has been caused more by the Governor Wolf or the state legislature? Yeah, and you can see by these numbers, there's a lot of blame to go around. About a quarter say it's Governor Wolf who's uh, behind the problem more than anybody else. The legislature, uh, about four out of ten say that. Uh, as we've looked at these poll numbers throughout the fall, we've seen that both Governor Wolf and the legislature have taken a toll in terms of their popularity. 
And as we're seeing, a majority of Pennsylvanians, according to this poll, are very concerned that the state budget has yet to be passed. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the sticking points between the governor's office and the Republican-led state legislature. The next question says, in order to help reduce the state's budget shortfalls, some have called for Pennsylvania to sell uh, the state-owned liquor stores. Do you support or strongly oppose the sale of the state's liquor sales? Yeah, we've been tracking this issue for seemingly ever. It's been an ongoing issue in Pennsylvania politics and part of budget cycles. As you can see from these numbers, the state is fairly divided on the issue. A plurality say they support this uh, with substantial portion uh, saying that they oppose. Over the years, this has actually closed up. A few years ago, it was much stronger support for sales of the liquor stores. Uh, over years, we've seen this narrow in terms of the, the margin of, of support across the state. Let's move on to our next question. Many states have created severance taxes in which drillers pay a tax that is based on the value of natural gas and oil that they extract from below the ground. Pennsylvania currently does not have such a tax. The question you posed was, do you think that Pennsylvania should adopt a severance tax on gas and oil drilling or not? Yeah, we've asked this question again for a long time in the state, and it has been amazingly consistent. About two-thirds of Pennsylvanians over the last four or five years have said we should have a tax. Interesting enough, the, the rumors coming out of Harrisburg right now is that this is off the table for this particular budget cycle um, against what I would say very strong public opinion over, over the last few years and into this fall. So let's head on to our final question we're going to look at today. Some say a way to solve the state's budget deficit is to expand gaming in the state to include option, options such as internet gaming and placing slot machines in areas such as off-track betting facilities and airports. The final question we look at asks whether or not Pennsylvanians support or, or oppose the expansion of gaming in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and you can see from these numbers, Brittany, that a strong uh, majority uh, of Pennsylvanians do think uh, or oppose this right now. For a long time, gambling has been the low-hanging fruit in Pennsylvania budget politics. Uh, let's go once again to the well and try to extract it by expanding gaming in different parts. It seems like Pennsylvanians largely are a little dissatisfied with this approach to, to filling the budget gaps in Harrisburg at this point. Based on this information that we're looking at today, can we draw any conclusions how the balance of leadership may change in the state legislature, Republican versus Democrat? Well, it's hard to say what the, the long-term ramifications of this particular budget crisis or budget fallout uh, is, is going to have in the state. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that Pennsylvanians right now are dissatisfied with the way things are going in Harrisburg. We've seen in our polls uh, really declining approval rates for both the legislature and for Governor Wolf. Uh, once the details of this budget um, negotiation are, are, are out to the public, it'll be interesting to see where, where the public ends up uh, on these, uh, these matters. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris Vorek. My pleasure. Laura, back to you. Thank you, Brittany. To learn more, let's welcome a panel of local leaders. Northampton County Executive John Brown, former Lehigh County Executive and current President and Chief Executive Officer of the Lehigh Valley Economic Development Corporation, Don Cunningham, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Community Services for Children, Michael Walker, and Executive Director of the Community Action Development Corporation of the Lehigh Valley, Alan Jennings. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. John, we'll begin with you. How has the uh, county in Northampton County prepared uh, to go well into December and possibly into 2016 without any state funding? Well, we don't typically plan to go that far. You know, we always plan for uh, two months. You know, the budget's never passed June 30th when we would prefer it. So we typically plan into figuring August, September, we're going to have to um, carry it a little bit. Uh, but December is a little bit of a reach for the county. So uh, recently, just in the last couple of weeks, we went to council um, and asked them to pass an emergency resolution allowing us to borrow up to $50 million in order to keep our cash flow needs moving in the county. Uh, that would take us uh, to about mid-March of uh, next year. So we, that's when our tax receipts would start coming in. So we built back from there. So uh, we're good right now as of December 1st. Uh, we have enough cash to keep going. Uh, Be because if an agreement is reached in... Uh late November or early December, it could be another 60 days before yeah, well, money actually that, starts to trickle down. Is that's that our, the that's idea? our assumption. We're assuming we'll have to uh, still fund our own needs for about 60 days before the uh, uh, money start actually coming in from the state uh, going forward. So as of this point, we're already looking at the end of January um, 
as, as probably the earliest we would see cash. Okay, and yeah. Michael, your agency operates pre-K counts programs. How many kids are relying on this money? Yeah, in addition to the pre-K counts program, we have a number of kids uh, services that uh, are going to be impacted. In fact, a little less than 400 kids will be impacted. Um, but we've been okay thus far. Uh, we have a line of credit that we are drawing off of, so we are okay. But some of those smaller organizations, I know they're suffering. Okay, and Alan, how's your organization faring as we wait? Well, one of the things that people miss, and um, and it's it's in important, is that federal money that comes into the state f through block grants um, mm -hmm. is being held up. So that's not even, I mean, that's money that the federal taxpayers have already paid. Uh, the money is in the state's hands, and because there hasn't been b budget authority yet, we're not getting that funding. We're owed right now $1.2 million um, by the Commonwealth. Um, John uh, didn't mention, I think you're, you're floating some of the human service providers. Uh. Well, as of, um, as of the end of this month, we will have uh, liquidated about $50 million of our assets in order to meet our cash flow needs. And of that, $35 million would be uh, complete support of the human services uh, programs within the county. My point is that it would be a whole lot worse if it wasn't for John mm -hmm. Brown and his counterpart in Lehigh County mm -hmm. going out on a limb on behalf of the nonprofit sector. Mm. Yeah. Todd, you have an interesting historic perspective on this. You were the Lehigh County executive uh, the last time we had a budget impasse go until I believe it was October in 2009. Yeah, I think the deepest one I was involved in, though, when I was a cabinet secretary with Governor Correct. Rendell, and back in, I think it was 03 or 04, and we went this deep into, into the year. Uh, you know, when this typically occurs, it shouldn't occur, but it typically occurs when you have deeply divided government. You know, in Pennsylvania, you have a, a, a deeply controlled Republican General Assembly and a Democratic governor who's new, uh, both kind of standing firm on their own beliefs and, um, and not being able to find a compromise in a reasonable amount of time and then organizations like these and the public suffer. What did we mm -hmm. learn from 2003 and then six years later mm -hmm. in 2009? In that your opinion? things don't change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you we know, don't learn anything I mean, in we, Pennsylvania. You know, it's different players, huh. right? So back then it was uh, different leaders in the General Assembly and the governor, but uh, I think when this occurs is when you have uh, divided government, and uh, this is this becomes the fallout when folks can't get together um, to work something out in a reasonable amount of time. And then it, you don't know what kind of quality budget you're going to get in the end. We're starting to hear details trickling out, um, and and uh, we'll we'll have to wait and see to to see whether this was worth the wait. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. This gets you to the point where you're not sure what's worse. Um, getting the budget they give you or not having a budget at all um, <laughs> because, you know, there are a lot of de details that aren't, aren't worked out, but we've got to get money flowing. So, you know, we, it's even not even easy to figure out who to blame. Um, people have used the, the term debate. This isn't a debate. This is a standoff. This is two sides basically staring each other down to score political points. Mm -hmm. And the people of Pennsylvania are hanging in the balance as victims of their, their politics. You know, the one thing that's amazing in Harrisburg that I, w I was amazed by the time I spent there, how few people end up being involved in these things. Yes. You have a General Assembly of 253 with the legislature and the Senate, uh, but the reality is it probably comes down to about 15 people. The governor, the governor's chief of staff, the legislative secretary, and then the leadership of, of uh, the Republican caucuses in the House and the Senate. Right now, what they're probably trying to do is go get the rank and file folks in line uh, to see if they can round up enough votes to get support for the framework that they've worked out. And a lot of horse trading goes on to get those votes lined up. So uh, the, the devil will be in the details of whether, as Alan says, we're, we're better off with a budget or what comes out of this. Well, Laura, on the education side, I think we're a little bit optimistic. Um, what I'm hearing so far is, at a minimum, we're talking about $350 million added to the budget at a maximum, maybe $750 million added to the budget for education. So we're somewhat optimistic that uh, those things will pass. Go ahead, Alan. Well, um, Michael's right. Um, there is a substantial chunk of new money in it in the uh, education budget. Governor um, Wolf has got a, wi uh, a win in that sense, but the tax uh, offsets that have been used are are pretty painful to low-income people. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at a sales tax of seven and a quarter percent, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. will have the second highest sales tax in the nation. 
Uh, that raises a considerable amount of money, about $2 billion, but um, that's a fairly regressive tax because whether you make $100,000 a year or $30,000 a year, you're going to pay seven and a quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the offsets come from property tax reductions, if you're a renter, uh, if you're a more low income or working class renter, you're not going to win out too well in this, in this yeah, budget. What people need to understand is that the sales tax increase is exclusively being used to finance the property tax uh, cuts. And my understanding is those property taxes are not just um, residential property taxes, but it's also uh, corporate tax uh, 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 savings. So, you know, poor folks are being asked to shoulder mm -hmm. a burden, and they, they haven't got, you know, the ability to, you know, sh shoulder their own household burdens. Well, I'm also I mean, not, I'm not aware that the um, it's a, it's a one-time savings because the the school district can still turn around and, and raise rates. Uh, and taxes in the future, so they haven't capped it yet. So it's a, it's a. I say it is kind of a band-aid solution, um, uh, and but without a permanent solution. If you're going to cap property taxes for supporting the schools, then how do you put an, an income stream in that is sufficient to do that? So I think that's a problem with the proposal that is is. I'm not sure it's going to be addressed in this budget cycle. Yeah. Well, and in the proposal is uh, is a requirement that any tax increase that might be levied by the school districts going forward requires a, a voter referendum to get it done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a pretty uh, good way to bet that uh, there isn't going to be any new money coming from local property taxes for uh, educating our kids. You, you know, the, probably the biggest challenge when a budget goes this late uh, into November is you're, turn, you're going to turn around in three months start your budget cycle again. Because mm -hmm. by the Constitution, the governor has to release a budget by the beginning of March. So uh, a lot of this is going to depend on whether a, a two-step a two framework has been put in place where there's an agreement on let's get this budget done. We know we're going right into our next budget cycle and we're going to address some of the issues we left off the table uh, or if we go right back into that same impasse again because there are huge structural deficits that remain in the Pennsylvania budget. Um, this is really a masking over of things based on what we've heard hmm. so far. Well, and, and the fact that the, um, the uh, legislature and the governor did not pass a stopgap measure uh, was pr is problematic also. As Alan said, there were monies that should have been released and passed. They're passed through monies from the state. The fact that that's been held captive is really saying, okay, we're, we're putting the most vulnerable uh, on the hook, and that puts a burden on the county. Uh, we made the decision up front that we were not going to uh, stop funding um, those programs. But that puts the pressure on us at the county level in order to do that. Um, I think a stopgap measure should have been uh, passed, uh, which would then, as uh, Don was just saying, would allow those uh, more complicated issues to continue to be worked through that they couldn't find agreement on, and then take that into the next budget cycle uh, also. Michael, I see you. Yeah, un unfortunately, some of the things that we've left off the table, those issues, I don't think we'll, we'll get to all of those issues at the next round. Um, specifically, I'm talking about the extraction tax, the gas and oil tax that needs to happen. Pennsylvania is the only state that does not tax uh, the shale oil companies, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do that. Michael, I hear um, we were speaking before we started the taping that you are hearing from your sources that an agreement could be reached by Thanksgiving. Yes, we are optimistic by Thanksgiving. If everything goes right, uh, we'll have a budget. Yeah. Is it? Well, I think they have a framework. I think, again, I think the leadership has a general framework, but then you got to go back to the and get the numbers to support it. So mm -hmm. you got to go back to Republicans and get enough votes to vote for an increase in the sales tax. Um, and then you got to go back to the, the Democrats and convince them that they're getting enough in education increases mm -hmm. and property tax offsets to meet their budget. I mean, this is this what we're hearing in terms of the framework is a fairly long way off from what Governor Wolf started with. I mean, both sides are going to want to claim victory, uh, but in my view, this looks like he's had to compromise greatly. Uh, to get something to happen. Mm -hmm. one, one of the challenges also is uh, even if they reach the uh, budget agreement, it's in how do you implement it, right? There's still the implementation of some of the programs that are not, it's not well defined, you know, so there's still going to be a time lag uh, by the time mm -hmm. they figure out how to get that actually out into the, into the public sector. So that's going to be problematic uh, again for us at the county in terms of, you know, when will we get our money even if it is approved uh, and uh, going forward, you know, there is a cost to the taxpayer. 
uh, if we did borrow the $50 million, that's, that's almost a million dollars of, um, uh, that we have to pay that right now. I don't believe the state is planning on reimbursing us you're, for. You're referring to interest and fees interest on, associated interest, with that? Interest on, right, on that's money not borrowed. reimbursable. Right. Well, and I had, uh, in my interview with Dr. Mayo uh, at the Allentown School District, he is hearing from the governor's office that they may reimburse schools. What are you hearing for your agencies? Reimburse schools for debt service? For the, for the interest and fees associated with any money they'd have to borrow. Uh, well, that would be a good thing. That's that's good news. Yeah. But you have that not, is good news. We'll but petition for it, but you know, uh, as of right now, I don't believe that's part of the agreement, uh, I, I, at least for the county. Right. Yeah. That's what we've heard. So what will happen to your agencies then if in March a year's worth of funding is, in February or March, is released to you and you have to spend it by June 30th? Does that present any complications? I mean, I know for most of you, money is good no matter when it comes uh, to the table. Well, I mean, for us, uh, uh, the human services work off of the state budget cycle, which is, you know, uh, July 1st, June 30th. So they're spending the money. It's just coming out of our pocket mm -hmm. instead of the state's right now. So if we get we get caught up on that, they'll just stay in rhythm uh, for the remainder of their fiscal year. Uh, but as Don was saying, if, if we hit the same, if, if we hit the same issues come June 30th of next year, and some of them have been resolved, and they choose to follow the same kind of uh, stalemate approach, you know, uh, again, having to do this again for another five okay. months next year is not something uh, we'll be as um, considerate of, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. And if you think about it, next year is going to be even tougher because it's, a, it's an election yeah. year for the General Assembly. Uh, so you, one would think this would be the year they'd be more willing to put up the tough votes to kind of solve some of these intractable issues. The pension uh, situation is still huge. Mm -hmm and lends itself to a big deficit. You know, from what we hear at this time about this budget, it doesn't make the structural problems go away. No. Uh, so there's a lot of work that's gonna remain uh, into the beginning of next year. All right, well, yeah. we are out of time and I know we could talk about this issue at length. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Until then, remember to focus on what matters.